What is up, guys? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Slay at Home Speaker Series. We are coming to you every Thursday evening at 6 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, 5 o'clock uh, Pacific Time over there, and uh, even later than that over on the East Coast. So uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm seeing a ton of Truckee um, in the building. Truckee, you know, one of my favorite towns in California. Um, they still have that restaurant there, the Sleep In with the killer pancakes. Let me know in the chat there. Um, that place is awesome. One of my favorite California memories. Snooze. Yeah, snooze. That's it. Yes. Man, that place is awesome. Um, anyways, tonight's presentation is presented by the fine folks at Weston. Um, we, uh, you know, we make skis, snowboards, split boards. We sponsor a bunch of different guide services. We kind of have our hands in, in everything backcountry and just love uh, connecting with the local community. So thanks for tuning in this evening. Uh, we really do appreciate it. We've got this series going on all year long. Um, you know, so let, uh, if, if you haven't checked out the whole Slay at Home series, check it out on our Facebook page or our website. There's, I believe this is episode nine, um, and we're looking to do about 15 of these throughout this season. So check them out. You can, you know, give us a like, give us a follow if you want to see all those episodes. They're also on YouTube, our YouTube channel, Weston. So check those out. We've covered a, a variety of topics already. Um, everything from gear selection to avalanche education to human dynamics when you're out in the backcountry. Um, so definitely check those things out. Now we're kind of into terrain. So uh, we're, we're kind of into the, the really good stuff. We're going to be discussing terrain this evening. Sorry about that. Muted myself. Um, tonight's presentation is on Sierra Touring Zones. Uh, our guide partner for this evening is Golden State Guiding. Uh, I saw Ryan there uh, in the chat. If you guys have any questions about Golden State Guiding, ask Ryan in the chat there. Um, they are an outstanding guide service. They're kind of, I believe they do most of their touring kind of in that mammoth area. So, so more of the Eastern Sierras down there in Southern California, but amazing guide service. They do a ton of great split board programming as well. A lot of great intro to backcountry programming, so check them out. Also, Wolverine Publishing, um, you know, they, they publish a ton of great books um, on California and various other areas. The Eastern Sierra Avalanche Center, uh, kind of your, your number one source for forecast and um, avalanche information in, in this area. And then Tahoe Mountain Sports, one of our great Western dealers uh, based also there in Truckee. So really stoked to have all these great sponsors for tonight's talk. My name is Ben. I am the brand experience manager here at Weston. I, uh, I do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I, I get to help design our, our snowboards. I work on our design team. I, I oversee all of our backcountry education and, and I oversee all of our guide partnerships. So I've been a guide here in Colorado for a little over a decade and just love sharing knowledge and, and sharing my appreciation of the mountains with anybody who will listen. So hopefully, you know, we'll meet some of you guys on a skin track one day, but Without further ado, uh, our presenters this evening, Will Sperry um, is one of our great guides. And Will, thanks so much for being here, buddy. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, it's cool seeing everybody in the chat over there, some uh, familiar faces, some clients, some friends, all that stuff. So pretty cool. It is kind of weird talking into the uh, black hole here, but hopefully we can keep it exciting for y'all. Um, but yeah, my name is Will. Uh, I live in Truckee. I uh, guide for primarily Alpenglow in the area here, and then uh, just started this season with Golden State down in the Eastern Sierra, and uh, Ryan and I just ran the first uh, intro to backcountry down in Mammoth this past weekend, and it was a huge success, but uh, generally consider myself a huge explorer in California. That's what I love to do, especially on a split board, and especially when there's snow on the ground, so excited to share some thoughts and knowledge and have a conversation with Ben and Nate here tonight. Awesome, Will, man. Thanks so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. And our next presenter is Nate, Nate Greenberg. Thanks for tuning in, Nate, man. We really appreciate you have uh, you being here. Tell us uh, a little bit about what you're up to these days. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks a bunch for having me. And uh, it's really great to virtually hang out with all of you. It's obviously not the way I'd love to do it either, um, but I'm coming at you live from Crowley Lake, California, which is 
just a little south of Mammoth here in Eastern Sierra. I've uh, been here for about 20 years or so now and um, basically moved here to ski and climb and, and kind of explore these mountains. Um, helped write the kind of first real definitive comprehensive guidebook for the whole range uh, basically south of Bridgeport um, in the early 2000s and have kind of kept that up over a uh, recent bunch of years and also um, very involved with the Eastern Sierra Avalanche Center and serve as the president of that organization today. So, um, you know, a lot of my interest is in exploration and, you know, just personal pursuits in, in the range, but also really helping people be successful and really trying to communicate the importance of um, responsibility of uh, learning and education and professional development and you know really ultimately people making good decisions out there so that they can stay safe and we don't end up dealing with sending rescuers in and, and the likes of that so um, yeah psyched to be here tonight and talk a bit about the eastern sierra absolutely man thanks so much for being here we're, we're really looking forward to tonight's presentation so before we get started, I'll kind of run you guys through through everything we're going to discuss this evening. Obviously, you know, in an hour and a half, we can't cover all the great mountains that we would love to discuss this evening. We'll just kind of hit on, you know, some some highlights. Our, the goal this evening is kind of to, to give you some ideas to kind of spread out, right? So we're not going to cover, you know, the, the pass next door that the parking lot's full at, right? Like we're trying to spread you guys out, give you some ideas, you know, give you some some cool places to re research yourselves and check out in the future. Um, so we'll kind of start with, you know, what you need to prepare for one of these kinds of trips, just some, some basic stuff that we've covered. We'll kind of give a quick overview of the Sierra and, and why it's awesome. Um, and then we'll kind of run through these different zones. So, so Shasta, Lawson, um, we'll, we'll briefly discuss Truckee and Tahoe um, and Virginia Lakes, Mammoth, McGee Creek, and Bishop down in the Eastern Sierra. But if you guys do have questions on other areas, feel free to let us know in the chat. Um, if you have questions at all, you know, let us know in the chat. You can also send us direct questions if you have them, but we'd love if you just left your questions public so, so everybody can read them. And then uh, we'll try to answer those, you know, live um, as we go on. But um, if we do get kind of a backlog or if at the end of the presentation you have some questions, just let us know and we'll have kind of a short little period for, for Q&A. So um, with that being said, you know, there, there is a lot to think about before you just go into the backcountry, right? We, we kind of have this disclaimer on every terrain discussion that we do. Um, we've covered all of these great topics in really lengthy webinars prior to this one. So again, if you have questions on gear, avalanche education, you know, what skill level you need to be to get into the backcountry in the first place. Um, check out our previous episodes of the Slay at Home Speaker Series. They're under the education tab on the Weston website. Um, we teach you how to check the forecast, you know, how to plan a trip. Um, we even, you know, go over how to use guidebooks, um, which, you know, are very useful tools in the backcountry. And at the end of the day, you know, there's always variables the day of that should dictate your line choice, everything from the weather and the snowpack and the group dynamics, um, you know, and, and it's very important that you always let those things dictate your line choice in the backcountry. You don't get summit fever and you don't make bad decisions. Um, we all want to come home safely at the end of the day, right? And if you have doubts, go with a guide. You know, um, again, guides are, are some of the most knowledgeable people you will ever encounter. And they're, you know, the way to guarantee that you're going to have a great time in the backcountry. So definitely reach out to a guide. If you're looking out to check in one of these areas in one day, you might get a huge variety of learning and education. And then you can go back to that area and learn more. But it's, it's a great way to learn about a new area, right? When I go to BC or Japan, like I'm not just wandering around by myself, I always hire a guide. So um, the Tahoe Backcountry Alliance, Will, um, you're a Tahoe local. Tell us a little bit more about the TBA and what they're up to. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, this year, everyone kind of was anticipating a huge boom in the backcountry, which we've seen so far. You know, trailheads are crazy. Uh, Castle Peak will be full by eight in the morning. And if you're not there before eight, uh, you got to go somewhere else. And so uh, kind of these access issues have been bubbling up for a long time. And the combination of COVID and interest in backcountry has really 
brought all that stuff to the forefront. And uh, Tahoe Backcountry Alliance is kind of the, the main advocacy group in the Tahoe Basin and Truckee area uh, that talks with the land managers and really uh, advocates for human powered backcountry skiers. Um, so right now, the current projects are the Donner Lake Run. And I think that project is just about closed out. Um, basically at Donner Lake, you can hike up from uh, Summit House and ski Trestle Peak all the way down to Donner Lake and TBA has uh, negotiated a plowed parking area so we don't piss off all the uh, full-time homeowners down there. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's in the West End uh, beach parking lot. So that's cool. Rubicon Peak, anyone who skis in Tahoe knows that that parking is a total junk show. And they're working on that, trying to make a permanent plowed parking zone up there. And then same with Hidden Peak down on 89, they're pushing to get better parking. So it's a really good way to, you know, if you have some extra dollars, donate to help with the access in the Tahoe Basin. Yeah. Killer. Yeah, they do a lot of great work. We did uh, a, an avalanche awareness series last year with those guys. Maybe some of you guys were able to attend those. Obviously, you know, we couldn't do them this year, but we hope to do a lot, lot more great things with TBA in the future. Yeah, and so uh, kind of talking about the increased use this season that we're all seeing, this uh, Ski Kind um, product has come out and really trying to train new backcountry users into like how to be good people in the backcountry. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever gone surfing in somewhere where they're not super friendly to locals, but we want to avoid the surfing mentality in the backcountry. Um, and so these kind of ski kind um, ideals are a great place to start for y'all to think about in addition to, you know, avalanche hazard and where to go is how can I leave no trace be self-reliant, be inclusive, uh, be aware of the conditions around me, be respectful, respectful, smart, and kind. Cause you know, we're all humans and we're all just trying to slay power out there. So uh, just something to look into, check out skikind.org and yeah. Um, so we're talking mainly about Sierra Touring Zones, but uh, if you guys saw on the agenda, we have Lassen and Shasta on there, which are obviously part of the Cascade mountain range. Um, and we wanted to just take a sec, Nate and I, to talk about snowpack and what we're seeing up here. And uh, it looks like we have a bunch of Tahoe people and a few Mammoth people. Everybody's aware our snowpack is super low this year. And when it wasn't low, we were dealing with persistent slab problems. So. Um, Nate, you want to talk about the drought year so far? Yeah, not really, but I'm um, happy to <laughs> kind of touch on some of it. And, you know, one of the things that I'll say before I kind of go there is, um, you know, the, the ski kind piece, I think, is extremely important in the context of the current conditions that we're in today as well. It's as much about being a responsible backcountry user as it is about, um, you know, understanding what the, the major principles of uh, you know, just being respectful to the land and everything are. And I think, especially in periods like now where we've got low snow and people are really condensed and you know, it's not really about avalanche hazard, but it's about being smart when you're traveling in the backcountry and things like that. It's really, it's it, a lot of the things that I think we are trying to deal with as guides, as avalanche centers are about education and, and people being prepared for the conditions in the environment that they're coming into. And, um, you know, it's not lost on anybody who lives in the Sierra at this point that it is a drought year. It's, um, you know, certainly the, last year was a drought year as well. And this year is on track to be worse. It's definitely, um, I think it's the driest December on record. It was the driest November on record. Um, not much better than the driest January on record. And we've got some snowfall in the forecast coming up, but it's, you know, things are a little bleak out there right now. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about today are, um, you know, touring options and some of the best uh, skiing you could find in probably the, the country, if not the world, but not all of that is necessarily available right today. And so just kind of wanted to start with that little bit of disclaimer. And actually, um, this next shot is uh, taken from my front porch uh, yesterday. Um, beautiful out, but not the way you would expect to see it. This is looking at 
uh, Baldwin and White Fang and McGee up McGee Creek drainage and um, all the south faces with all that beautiful sun on it. Normally, all that stuff is covered in white, and it's uh, it's not right now. And um, you know, Mammoth Basin really doesn't look a whole lot better. Um, this next shot is looking at Mammoth Mountain Ski Area there on the left across Crowley Lake with the minarets and Ritter and Banner. And you know, again, almost all of this would normally be fully fully white, even all the way down to the valley floor, and it's not. And so. Uh, you know, certainly it funnels people into uh, a fairly small amount of terrain at, at the moment. And, you know, hopefully that changes here in the near future. But um, it's uh, just something that we want you all to be aware of. And, you know, everything that comes with that, not only access, but um, also avalanche problems as it starts snowing and, and things like that. Um, but that said, you know, I think uh, one of the things that Will and I wanted to talk a little bit about is the, the spirit of the Sierra. And, you know, for those of you who've spent time here, this probably isn't lost on you. For those of you who haven't, you know, there's a lifetime of adventure here. I mean, there are really more than one lifetime of adventure here. It's, I've been here 20 years and I've skied a, a tremendous amount in the kind of front range portions of, of the range. And it would take me easily another 20 to 40 years probably to ski, um, you know, the next layer beyond that. Um, and so there's a, just a tremendous amount of terrain to choose from, um, you know, just incredible, incredible opportunities for adventure uh, that we'll kind of touch on a little bit. Um, but, you know, with that comes some interesting things, like there's not a lot of information out there on first descents or descensionists. And, um, you know, that's kind of this cool, mysterious piece that like some stuff is kind of known that was maybe skied in the last couple of decades. But, you know, a lot of the stuff was skied in the 70s and 80s by people that were uh, you know, generally pretty silent about it. And, you know, some stuff dates back even further than that. And there's a, just a long history of, of guiding and professional skills development. Um, AMGA, uh, you know, kind of grew out of the Palisade School of Mountaineering, which was rooted down in the southern part of the Sierra. Um, and so it's just a, it's an incredibly cool place um, that, you know, when you read guidebooks from here, you know, generally speaking, they're detailed enough to get you to where you need to go and to get you kind of into some adventure, but leaving a fair bit for, for speculation and excitement as well. And so, um, you know, I think that that's just something to expect when you come here is that it will be probably different than an experience you would, you would find in, uh, you know, the Wasatch or Uintas or, you know, some of the other major mountain ranges of, of the West. Yeah, Nate, just to add a little bit to that, um, Kind of the spirit of the Sierra is exploration and that's kind of what Nate and Ben and I are trying to hit on tonight is you know give you guys a little a few nuggets of, of knowledge and information and really trying to harp on the beauty of exploration in California because um, I know for me it's a you know from Truckee it's like a three and a half hour drive from here to Mammoth and in that drive alone you could ski you know every 10 minutes on a new mountain and uh and so, you know, we're going to highlight these zones tonight, but just know that really the beauty of it comes through the exploration and finding out and going out. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, here's like kind of big picture California zone overview. overview. Uh, we're going to start up north at Mount Shasta, uh, kind of the mecca of spring skiing off of volcanoes in California. Um, then we'll move down to Mount Lassen, uh, touch briefly on the Tahoe area, and I'm more just going to share some Stoke photos and not really dive into any zones too specifically. Uh, and then Nate will take over on the east side. Yeah, so we can check the next slide here. We got Avalanche Gulch on Mount Shasta. Um, awesome, awesome classic route. I worked up here for a summer probably hiked up and down that thing 12 times in, in three months. And I don't know if I'll do it again without a snowboard on my back, but it is an awesome mountain. Um, and if you guys have never heard the kind of lore behind Mount Shasta, uh, you know, supposedly there's aliens that live inside of it. Uh, it's a chakra of the earth. Um, there's crazy stuff that happens up there. And you can ski 7,000 feet from the top of it if you want. Um, so yeah, if we uh, check out the next slide that has an upshot of Avalanche Gulch, this is some of the terrain you're looking at. And you know, even midwinter, I'll uh, 
if I drive up there, I'll take a tour up to Lake Helen there, just kind of in the middle and not going above that, which is at 10,000 feet and just ski that huge Alpine bowl back to Bunny Flat. And that's an awesome day in itself. Um, kind of to the right of this photo over Sergeant's Ridge, you have Old Ski Bowl, which is a great zone to access from Bunny Flat. And then to the left uh, over Cassaval Ridge, you have the West Face, which has some great little mini golf shots off of Cassaval Ridge, or you ski the classic uh, West Face from the top of uh, Shasta. And this doesn't even account for the east side, which is kind of the more classic spring skiing, but Bunny Flat's a great place to start. Um, I think we have got some more Stoke photos here. Yeah, so this uh, picture on the left is an avalanche runout path from the, I think they called it the Valentine's Day avalanche two seasons ago. And it was a huge storm, I think like seven inches of water or something like that. And they think that this avalanche broke at the top of Castleval Ridge and Avalanche Gulch and ran all the way down through here. And then almost, if anyone's ever been to Bunny Flat, you turn a corner right as you start climbing up and the avalanche ran almost to the base of that corner. And uh, it was a massive slide. And so this is just kind of showing you the snowpack you can get up in Shasta. Um, I think the picture on the right is in May, maybe. And, uh, you know, 12 feet at the trailhead still. So they get an awesome, awesome snowpack in a big year, which lets you ski well into July. Um, yeah, and then, you know, you can, you can opt for a few ways to do it. Some people will uh, climb and ski the mountain in a day, all 7,000 feet. Sometimes you get to camp out if you're into the ski mountaineering and camping thing. I like doing a base camp ski in the um, uh, Hidden Valley on the West Face where you can set up camp for a few days and just ski all the lines your heart desires. And then another beauty about camping on the mountain is if we uh, check out this next shot, you get to see these epic sunrises on Mount Shasta. And uh, I don't know if you guys can see, but there's a shadow on the horizon of, so this happens during the sunrise and uh, because Shasta is so prominent, it casts its own shadow onto the horizon. It's a pretty special experience if you've never seen it before. Um, yeah, so Shasta is a very special place, great place to do some spring skiing, mellower winter skiing. Um, cool, and then next spot we got is the Lassen National Park. And uh, Lassen's this cool little hidden gem um, that not, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a little secret. A lot of people know about it, but Usually in, in a season like this, when a lot of the storms are missing us in Tahoe, they'll swing north and uh, Lassen can really reap the benefits of a northern storm track. Um, so Lassen's great. You can roll up and park in the southern parking lot and camp out for free there. And there's, you know, non-COVID times, there's a nice little uh, parking lot community where you can cook and drink beer or drink kombucha, whatever your fancy is. And uh, they groom the, the winter road all winter. So there's a great little access path to get you into the park. Um, and then, we, yeah, so here's that access road. Um, doesn't look like we have any split borders in the shot, but you know, great open terrain, lots of tree terrain, um, a good amount of alpine terrain. So all sorts of stuff and um, really just a cool spot to explore. And this, uh, this is a shot of Brokoff Mountain, kind of looking south from closer to Lassen proper. And, you know, you can see a ton of, of awesome tree skiing, um, just a really fun place to explore. Yeah, um, actually on this, sorry, can we go back to the Brokoff shot real quick? So they used to have uh, a ski resort in Lassen in the 50s and 60s, and I think maybe into the 70s, but it got taken out by an avalanche at some point. Um, but they named the one ski lift going under Brokoff uh, Bump Pass Heaven because there's this big fumarole uh, in the park, these volcanic kind of lava pits without lava, but gas. And, um, and this guy, this explorer way back in the day fell in and burned his leg and they nicknamed it Bump Pass Hell. So they did a little play to be ascending instead of descending. 
So just a cool zone, great to explore, walk around, check out some snow if we don't have it in Tahoe. Uh, I saw a little comment down here that Lassen lacks AVI forecasters. That is correct. There's no official avalanche forecast for uh, Lassen. And what I'll typically do um, is I'll, I'll look at the Sierra Avalanche Center and I'll look at the Mount Shasta Avalanche Center and almost make a, a inference based on the two zones. Um, and sometimes uh, Lassen will represent Shasta a little more and sometimes it'll represent Tahoe a little more, just depending on how the storms come in. Um, but like anything, you know, it takes a little more assessment out there because there is no um, forecast that's put out. Uh, but, you know, a good alternative if you're not comfortable doing that is heading out in the spring and you can ski these lines that you're looking at right here um, off the north side in the uh, devastated area. And, you know, you really only are worrying about uh, loose wet avalanches and just trying to get off the mountain early. Um, I see another question here. What's the danger of thermal gas up there? Yeah, so you should, they're clearly marked on the maps and they, the park rangers recommend not touring around those zones because you can get bridges of snow over the thermal, um, over the thermal vents and you can break through and get burned. So they say avoid those areas when you're touring out there. Um, cool. On to North Tahoe and the Tahoe Basin. Sorry for all my South Lake folks. We didn't really include Carson Pass on here, but uh, we're just doing a quick overview anyways. We'll leave your secrets to you guys down there. Um, but in this map, you know, we have Donner Lake in the top left, all the way down to Fallen Leaf Lake and South Lake Tahoe, Zephyr Cove. And there is just a ton of terrain and skiable terrain, um, basically in that whole area. And kind of the highlights are the Donner Pass area by Donner Lake. Highway 89 has a ton of good stuff. Uh, Mount Rose Summit and then West Shore is kind of classic Tahoe skiing. And then South Lake, you know, you have Talac and Carson Pass and all that stuff. So great stuff. Um, you know, season we call winter, spring and summer. If you're adventurous enough, you can get back into desolation and ski some stuff in the summer. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to share some Stoke photos with you guys to help ignite the, uh, the ski bug. So this, this top photo is from winter uh, two years ago when we had that massive, massive February. I think it snowed at least a foot like every day. It was totally insane. And then this day I was out, was on Rubic Rubicon Peak and it was the first sun that I had seen in a month. And I just remember being absolutely blown away by the color of the lake and how white everything was, super cool. And then the uh, bottom photo is taken from like Chickadee Ridge, Mount Rose area looking south uh, in a springtime snowpack. And yeah, kind of shows the beauty of where we're at. Um, yeah, great. Oh, Greer, what up? Yeah, you were there when we took the top photo. That was awesome. Uh, cool, so we can keep rolling here on the Stoke photos. This is a little hidden zone in the uh, Granite Chief area. You're actually looking in the middle of the photo uh, at the top of Granite Chief Peak at Squaw Valley. And then this uh, drops to the north, uh, northwest of Granite Chief Peak. And this is the Nat Geo area. And this again is on that huge winter when everything was super filled in and awesome. Yeah. One of my buddies, Isaac and Rad in a, in a super top secret, steep couloir down in South Lake Tahoe. Um, Got to get the steep riders in there. Sorry, Erica. We can call it Olympic Valley. <laughs> um, and then the one zone I did want to talk about a little bit as a great beginner area is Castle Peak. Um, there have been a ton of issues with parking up there this year. And I know the California Snow Park is now uh, restricting access. They're only letting 100 cars in at a time. So if Castle Peak is a spot where you want to go, uh, either A, go midweek or B, show up uh, really early but there's a ton of great terrain. Kind of on the south side, you have good spring skiing, low angle stuff. North side, you can find a few low angle areas. Um, and then kind of the gem of the Castle Peak area is a steep, steeper uh, shoots on the north. And so this is all good springtime, midwinter, um, all that stuff. Yeah. 
we got some more photos here. You can do some uh, ski mountaineering practice when we have a low snowfall and you want to get your spiky things out. And there's a great like third class ridge line along this whole thing that can be fun. And it gives you a good idea of, you know, it goes from steeper to less steep uh, as you kind of progress around this cirque behind Castle Peak. Yeah. And then this year, Tahoe Mountain Sports is doing what they're calling the Castle Peak Uphill Challenge. It actually starts tomorrow. And if you have uh, some sort of GPS tracker, you can enter the race. I think you gotta sign up on their website. Um, but basically they're doing a, an elite and sport level group. And it's a race from the avalanche beacon sign kind of at the start of the trailhead, uh, basically to the top of the shoulder on the left of the picture there. Um, I think it's about 1500 feet, maybe 2000 vertical feet of climbing. And uh, you can win a Western split board and all sorts of other gear. So uh, just a fun way to kind of test your fastest known time on, uh, on the uphill at Castle Peak. Uh, Rob Donner Summit near Sugar Bowl. Yeah, it's pretty close to Sugar Bowl. Um, I would say the Castle Peak zone is closer to Boreal. You almost go to the Boreal parking lot and then walk under the um, walk under the freeway to the snow use area. One of the really cool things about uh, kind of the Highway 89 corridor from Donner Summit down to Squaw Valley is we have the Sierra Club backcountry huts, and the Peter Grubb hut is at Castle Peak and they're closed this year, unfortunately, due to COVID. But um, if a hut trip is something that interests you, you could probably start looking this spring for the following year. And uh, you could even do a three nights with at all three of the huts moving from Squaw down to, or excuse me, from Olympic Valley to uh, Castle Peak or vice versa. Um, so yeah, cool little spot to hang out in the snow. And yeah, on to Nate. Awesome. Thanks, Will. So um, yeah, for those of you who haven't been to the east side, as we like to call it, of the Eastern Sierra, uh, it's essentially man, it's about 110, 120 mile stretch um, from Bridgeport, which is about three hours, uh, sorry, two hours south of Reno, uh, to Lone Pine, which is about four hours north of LA. And that's kind of the meat of what we refer to as the Eastern Sierra. Um, basically, you know, the 14,000 foot peaks in the Sierra Nevada are all kind of in the southern part of that range, more or less from Big Pine to Lone Pine. Um, and as you get to the northern part in Bridgeport, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of big mountains and then you kind of start getting north up into the southern part of the, the Tahoe area. Um, so, you know, the Sierra, as most people know, are predominantly a north-south running range. I mean, technically, it's kind of more of a uh, northwest to southeast. Um, and actually, if you could go back one slide really quick, Ben, um, you know, along that whole east side of the range there, that big black line is Highway 395. And that runs more or less along the whole Owens Valley um, and in between the Sierra on the left and the White Mountains and the Inyo Mountains and a bunch of other really big mountain ranges, which each have a lifetime of skiing in them. Um, but we're just talking about kind of the east side and those areas with all those little brown kind of lines drawn around them this evening. So uh, yeah, now you can jump forward. So um, as I said, it's pretty much a you know north-south running range and most of the canyons are kind of east-west running and um, the whole eastern kind of side of, of the range is on a, a strike slip fault, a super active um, fault and you know it's all pretty heavily glaciated and so there's a tremendous amount of vertical relief from, you know, the highest peaks on the, the crest there. Uh, you can kind of see to the, the west of that Owens Valley label, uh, in between the Owens Valley label and the Sierra Nevada Mountains label. That's where a lot of the 14ers are, you know, and then down to the Valley floor. And yeah, you can ski 7,000 feet off of Shasta, but you could ski, you know, 8,500 feet off of some of the highest peaks in the Southern Sierra and some pretty cool, um, pretty cool uh, places to go check out. So yeah, kind of an interesting, um, interesting setup. You know, most of the skiing is um, north, south, or east facing, uh, just because of the way the range is set up. And we tremendously uh, seek out north facing around here. Um, but you know, there's a lot of really good east facing and and quite a bit of good south facing when the snowpack is uh, accommodating that. 
So um, the first kind of zone I want to talk about, and I'm going to work north to south, is uh, a drainage called Virginia Lakes um, or Virginia Creek. So this is about uh, 15 minutes south of Bridgeport um, and kind of right at the top of Conway Summit, which is sort of the big first uh, pass, so to speak, or summit that divides the northern portion of the Sierra from kind of the central portion of the, the Sierra. Um, the Virginia Lakes area is pretty accessible um, in the, it, we say winter or spring, you could take it a little bit later, um, deeper into spring. Um, and actually one of the things that I'll say is that uh, a, a nice little, um, not, not secret, but kind of skier trick in the Eastern Sierra is that um, we call it skier opening, but it's really fish, fishing opening, which um, when the fishing season opens in California, which is the last weekend in April of every year, um, they plow pretty much all of the roads that go into most all of these canyons so that people can go up and hang out on frozen lakes and ice fish. Um, but that means for skiers that we get tremendous access into a lot of these great, great trailheads. So early season, um, a lot of the roads are still passable. And in the middle of the winter, if it really starts dumping, um, a lot of these roads close down. And so you can have some long approaches. Um, some stuff does get plowed. Um, some stuff you can snow machine on or you know, a lot of stuff you end up kind of walking on. But yeah, for the most part in Virginia Lakes, that road is accessible, I'd say like 60% of the season. And it takes you up into a really sweet little hanging kind of Alpine Valley um, that's about, you know, 9,500 feet, and it's surrounded um, by great peaks that are all roadside. And uh, on the north kind of side of the trailhead parking is a super classic peak called Dunderberg. Um, we'll show you a photo of that. There's a like really nice south-facing couloir on it and some nice uh, kind of southeast terrain. And then on the south side of the canyon are um, a few peaks that have some great north and east-facing terrain and like a little bit of scrubby tree skiing and things like that. And so it's a really nice place just to go kind of hang out. Um, uh, we say intermediate because, you know, it's hard to actually be a backcountry skier as a beginner skier, but um, really it's, there's a lot of really good terrain to choose from if you're a new backcountry skier here that's relatively safe. Uh, so yeah, if you want to kind of skip ahead here. Um, this is kind of looking south from the Virginia Lakes Road at those peaks on the south side of the canyon. The first one on the left is Mount Olson. And uh, that lower kind of slide path looking thing in the trees um, is called uh, Deer Lake Ridge. And, you know, both of those have really nice, relatively moderate slope skiing and, um, you know, super fun. The middle peak is South Peak. Um, there's a great east facing shot that you kind of see right off the summit there that funnels into a really fun north facing shot and some of those scrubby trees, they look like rocks, but they're little scrubby trees and super fun, um, nice. And you know, all that's like literally five minute walk from the road, you start kind of going up. And then uh, in the back of the canyon, there's Black Mountain. Um, Red Lake Bowl is kind of in between um, Black Mountain and South Peak there. And, just a great amount of um, you know stuff to choose from in all of those places. That actually gets pretty rad if you if you want to go there. Um, and then on the other side of the canyon is this guy. This is Dunderberg Peak. This is actually taken from uh, the little ridge as you start to climb up onto that South Peak that we were just looking at a minute ago. Um, the big obvious couar right in the middle there is the South Couar on Dunderberg. Uh, it's a couple thousand foot. Um, basically true south facing run. It gets great corn. Uh, it's relatively safe. Um, it's, you know, it's a little steep at the top, but it's one of those things that if you're, uh, you know, advanced skier and, you know, looking for something a little bit, um, a little bit bigger, certainly, um, certainly, you know, it's, it's, it's worthy kind of, uh, objective to put on, on your list. And then that other kind of east facing, shot there is a really nice, um, a, a really nice kind of long descent that's nice and moderate that uh, drops you right back on the road as well. So super fun zone. This is um, booting up the South Core on Dunderberg. You can see Mona Lake there in the background. And that's one of the really cool things you'll see through a bunch of the photos we show tonight and in the east side as a general is you're looking 
down into the valley and down onto these big lakes and cool plateaus and various various things like that. So it's super fun and really picturesque. Um, and some great corn skiing can be found in, in all of these zones. So this is booting up the South Core of Dunderberg. And um, go to the next slide. This is um, just some other stuff that's up in Virginia that I'm not going to talk too much about, but it's in the book. There's, you know, there's a little bit of everything up there for, for folks. And, you know, if you're looking for some steeper kind of cool little hallways and, and couloirs, uh, you know, there's a lot of great stuff like that that can be found up in the upper part of the canyon. If you're looking for some adventure and some big lines uh, that are a la Alaska, uh, you know, 50 55 plus, um, there's some great stuff that's a little bit deeper up and over in Virginia. And so um, a lot of that stuff can be found in the ski guide and you can check out. So yeah, that's Virginia Lakes, great place to go check out. Um, really recommend it, super fun in the spring and, and great in the winter as well. So Mammoth is sort of the epicenter of skiing in the Eastern Sierra. Um, obviously Mammoth Mountain Ski Area is uh, rooted right there in, in Mammoth. Uh, Mammoth is the only incorporated city in uh, Mono County and kind of our little zone, about you know eight, uh, yeah, about eight or nine thousand people live there year round. Um, super cute little town, and uh, kind of it's um, it's got a bunch of stuff that's immediately accessible right adjacent to town, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, so town is kind of squeezed there, right between those two orange and yellow circles. You can sort of see. A little pastel -y color. And just to the north of town is a great little roadside shot called Earthquake Dome. Uh, some tree skiing, kind of not very high. So it's really nice in the storms and um, pretty safe, but uh, you know, certainly can avalanche and definitely has some, some stuff to kind of think about. And then there's some great skiing on the south side of town in uh, a zone called the Sherwins and Punta Bardini as well as Mammoth Crest. And the kind of lower aspects there, sort of right where the label of Sherwin's is and kind of right where the Eastern edge of that little orange and yellow blob is, offers some incredible tree skiing, some old growth, big timber, um, you know, super fun. Uh, again, can be really great place to go during storms. Um, very easily accessible, literally park your car in a nice big parking lot and skin right from your car. Um, and then you can get a little bit more adventurous and go up into the Lakes Basin, as it's called, where the Mammoth Crest is kind of uh, sitting right above. And there's some not very, very big, like thousand foot uh, kind of sized shots that drop down through some just big rocky uh, fins. And there's some cool couars and some other technical skiing, as well as some nice kind of mild and moderate skiing up there. And so um, if you're looking to ski powder, you're looking, um, you know, for a nice little place on, on storm days and things like that, Mammoth is a, is a great place to go uh, just with a, a variety of different sort of options available to you. And it's a really good spot sort of year round. Um, so this photo here is the backdrop actually of Mammoth. Um, this is Ritter and Banner and the Minarets. And I throw this in here just because it's such an iconic kind of place. The photo that we sort of showed early on in the talk this evening was also looking at Ritter Banner and the Midorettes. And, um, you know, this is ski touring, you know, kind of well outside of the Mammoth proper area. Uh, you know, it's a it's a pretty big fair to get out here and definitely a, an overnight usually, um, but some really cool high adventure up in the Alpine. Um, and it's just a super iconic backdrop that you see from all over Mammoth. Um, but really, I think what what skiing in Mammoth is known for more is, um, is kind of powder skiing. And um, this is, uh, actually I stole this photo from my buddy, uh, Christian Pondella of our friend, Chris Benchettler skiing in the Mammoth Crest um, below the Hollywood Bowl. And, you know, there's just, again, this like iconic rock and super fun trees and nice little playful terrain to go kind of hang out and, and play around on um, and keep kind of, leafing through these. Um, a lot of the skiing kind of right adjacent to town, this is skiing in that uh, Sherwin zone. You're literally looking right down on town. That, uh, that's a big condo development you kind of see there on the right side of the photo. Skiing in these great glades with um, you know, some thicker stands of trees, 
Um, but if you go to the next photo, there's a lot of really just beautiful, big old growth uh, tree skiing that can be found, you know, 30 to 40 degree, just incredible tree skiing that holds great winter snow kind of, um, you know, through the majority of, of the season. Yeah, and I, th so, I thought you took this photo in Tahoe. Oh, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> no, there'd be like a thousand tracks. <laughs> Sorry. Ouch. 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 <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, I think the next photo is kind of just a picture of walking into, oh, sorry, I guess that was it. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, great, fun place. Again, sort of a nice, good place to come and, and base out of and start uh, a little adventure on the Eastern Sierra, pretty user-friendly, great gear store, um, you know, a lot of good resources here in, in Mammoth. So then moving south just a little bit, um, is McGee Creek, and this is kind of my backyard. Um, our little community is sort of right there in, in the middle of this map, and on the northern end of McGee Creek, sort of flanking that east-west drainage, is McGee Mountain, and uh, this is another roadside attraction, about 11,000 foot peak. You can literally park your car and ski 3,000 vertical straight from the car, um, going, going straight up, and uh, Super cool, a lot of east facing terrain um, that drops right down on the road. There is some north at the northernmost end of McGee. And then there is a little bit of south and southeast that drops up into the upper part of the canyon as well. All super user friendly and, and, uh, and accessible. And then on the southern side of McGee uh, drainage is Red Mountain. And that is also a really nice roadside and um, basically offers some great kind of 2,500 or 3,000 foot descents and sort of uh, sparse trees and timber and things like that right down to the road as well. Hey, Nate. Yeah. Uh, we got a question in the chat uh, from, from uh, Scott asking if you could comment on your exposure and I think it's exposure and commitment um, ratings on in the guidebook. Sure, yeah. So um, it's hard without a visual, but basically um, if you're, it all familiar with the eights scale, the avalanche train exposure scale, which is a Canadian scale. It's basically a one, two, three rating. And the scale that's in our book is a five scale rating. And um, basically the, the one rated descents are those in which you uh, don't really experience any exposure and you, you know, you could fall, you could tumble, um, you know, you're not going to really have a lot of risk around um, injury from an exposure standpoint. So a lot of the tree skiing in, in the, um, in the Eastern Sierra is rated a one. Um, three becomes a little more, um, a little more committing and, you know, basically it would be steeper terrain with, um, you know, bigger exposure below you where if you fell, you would probably slide for a ways if you weren't able to control it and you probably, you could get injured. And, and five basically is um, no fall zones. Like in, in general, you're skiing above cliffs and big exposure in places that you really can't afford to, to lose an edge or fall. And so, um, you know, a lot of the kind of bigger lines and ski mountaineering tend to fall in the fours um, you know, and certainly there are a number of fives in the book, but there's a fair bit of um, stuff in kind of that uh, three range. And then a lot of the lower elevation tree skiing and the like is more in that one and two zone. And um, yeah, it was basically a way for us to talk about exposure. And by exposure, we mean sort of exposure um, over cliffs or above big terrain features and things like that, where, uh, you know, really... You're, you're not in a continuous slope or in a place that, um, you know, controlling a fall or something like that uh, would, would be as easy. And so as that exposure increases and you uh, basically, you know, get into steeper terrain, you just have a much higher risk. Yeah, Nate, could I add there too, just to kind of make the distinction that um, Nate's hazard or exposure rating uh, is only related to the terrain itself and you being in that terrain. It doesn't have anything to do with avalanche exposure or hazard. 
because most of the lines are in avalanche terrain on the east side. So it's kind of removing the uh, avalanche component and looking at it strictly from a, a severity of a fall in that terrain. Yeah, totally. That's a great, a great way to sort of add to that because um, certainly being in the, the bigger lines and more exposed terrain in avalanche um, conditions, you know, when the avalanche hazard is high, it adds, you know, an extra degree of, um, of risk to the whole thing. And so generally speaking, you know, the iconography that you'll see in the book is more or less green to black in a continuous scale that is following the avalanche danger threshold. And, you know, you certainly don't want to be skiing anything that's um, at a higher risk level when avalanche danger is, is high as well. So yeah, thanks for adding that. Um, cool. So yeah, McGee Creek, um, if you go to the next slide, this is a nice little photo of skiing the east base of McGee Peak. And, um, you know, again, just beautiful open terrain. There are some trees and things like that to ski in, but a lot of just cool bowls and ridge lines, a little bit of technical terrain here and there if you want to seek it out, but um, just awesome skiing right down to the road. And you can just barely see the road in the top left corner of that photo and some uh, kind of morainal ridges and things like that. And just a great way to get a bunch of vert right from the car without a lot of hassle of kind of trekking in somewhere. Um, I think the next photo is uh, just sort of looking down from the top of McGee um, on the valley below. And, you know, it, it's, it's neat because you're in the Alpine and you really can have a cool adventurous, you know, high Alpine experience, but again, not be super committed and, and really, really deep. Um, not to mean you, can, you can't run into some committing issues, but uh, yeah, just a beautiful place to come hang out. Really picturesque with the lake down in the valley below. And then uh, I don't remember if we have a photo. Oh uh, yeah, this is just kind of a couple other shots and that there's Crowley Lake in the background and um, you can ski Great Corn, you can ski Great Pow and yeah, cool, cool place to go check out. And moving south a little bit further, about a half hour south from McGee and Crowley is Bishop. And uh, that's kind of the next biggest community in the Eastern Sierra, also a little unincorporated town, a little bit bigger than Mammoth in terms of population. Um, and the Bishop skyline that you'll see a photo of in, in a minute here is uh, reminiscent of kind of the cathedral group and the main heart of the Tetons. Um, and we often joke that you could fit the entire Tetons into the Bishop skyline, but that's not exactly true. Um, but in the background, you know, you'll see just a lot of big peaks, you know, 13,000 foot peaks. Um, but it, uh, I guess you could say is a really condensed place to find a lot of adventure very, very quickly and easily. Um, and a tremendous amount of stuff to choose from. Um, and in general, uh, you know, a little bit higher level of experience and, and skill is, is prudent kind of in this zone, with the exception of the area that's kind of circled with that orange and yellow line, which is kind of right at the road head and road end there that you can drive to all, all, all winter long. Um, and that's an area called Bishop Bowl and, and Table Mountain. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's really cool about Bishop and it is very, very quintessential Eastern Sierras. You'll see the Buttermilks area label that's just to the north of that little blob. Um, super great world-class bouldering that's right there. And, you know, classic, classic Eastern Sierra experience is to wake up early, go ski corn on one of the big 13,000 foot peaks at the back of the, the range there, and then come down to your car, throw on flip-flops and shorts and go boulder for the afternoon. And uh, it's super possible on just about every given day um, except for the snowiest in, uh, in kind of the middle of winter. So um, yeah, next slide I think is a nice little photo of the Bishop skyline with uh, Mount Tom on the right, this big massive peak, which is, you know, probably, you know, five years worth of experience in skiing in, a, in and of itself. Uh, and then Basin and Humphreys, um, Mount, Mount Locke, kind of moving to the left across the Paiute crags that are on the far left. And just a tremendous amount of skiing all in that Bishop drainage. And um, just a, a lot of really great, great stuff to go experience and play with. 
Um, next slide though shows the Bishop Bowl area. And this is uh, the, the peak in the foreground, the little sub peak, um, which isn't tiny, but it's you know certainly not as big as the stuff in the background. This is um, you know a couple hour skin from the car. You can get to the top of Bishop Bowl. It's all really mellow, low angle skin. There's some trees, there's some open glades. Uh, you know, a little bit of rock to choose from at the top if you're looking for that kind of a thing. Um, but overall, just beautiful, fun skiing. And the uh, next photo just shows, you know, a little bit of that terrain kind of ski, skinning up and riding down, a, you know, fairly manageable and good spot to go is kind of a intermediate zone. And then across the, the valley from Bishop Bowl is uh, Table Mountain. And uh, that's kind of a similar little zone, you know, go to the next photo. Um, this is looking at Table Mountain. You can see a road cut there, kind of in the lower portion of the, of the slide. You can, you can skin right from the car. This is looking up um, what's called Jawbone Canyon on Table Mountain. And um, there's a, a lot of really great mellow skiing kind of in those trees and the glades and the rolls around there, or you could get a little bit rowdier and, and ski some shoots and again, all super accessible right from the car. And uh, I think the next photo shows just a little bit of that. And, you know, again, the cool thing about skiing in Bishop is that even when you're on these kind of smaller sub peak features, you got these beautiful shots and, uh, and views in the background with just, you know, the big peaks and, and the high Sierra that, that we all know and love uh, down here. So yeah, that's Bishop um, and, you know, those four zones probably keep you busy for a trip if you're here for a week. Um, and you know the, the thing that we like to say around around these parts is that you know when you're new to the Eastern Sierra, you, you get to the top of a summit and you're stoked and you can't wait to go down and you look off in the distance and you see 10 other objectives that basically uh, earmark your whole next trip. Um, this is skiing off the south side of Bloody Mountain, which is an iconic uh, peak. It's one of the 50 classic ski descents in North America. It's right on the kind of southern edge of Mammoth. And that peak in the distance with the, the big couloir splitting it is Red Slate, which is, um, it, you know, it should be a, a 50 classic. It's one of the most iconic peaks you can see from all around. And the cool thing, you know, in the Eastern Sierra beyond just incredible skiing that can be found everywhere is ski and corn and that's what this uh, area is really really known for in the spring is just incredible um, south and east facing aspects with with rad just big long open uh, corn descents. Nate I was gonna I was gonna add to your comment there about all the peaks that are in the on the east side so I always go down there with a tick list that I'm like all right I'm gonna tackle this stuff and each of those ticks it's like this exponential growth beyond that of adding more stuff to my list. And so the list is uh, never shrinking, always growing, but always getting checked off. So that's a good sign. That's a good sign. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So spring is a great time, especially this year to come, uh, come check out. And um, yeah, it's uh, I'm seeing a comment here from Lawrence upper buttermilk road, you know, it, it, it got washed out a few years ago and they rebuilt it. And so I don't know when the last time you were here was, it, it was better for a few years to go from Aspendale, but um, yeah, now that road is pretty solid. I mean, you definitely want something high clearance, but it doesn't need to necessarily be four wheel drive anymore. Um, that definitely changes from time to time, but um, that the, the access up there has actually improved a bit. And Lawrence, uh, I would so, say if you want to check out the Humphreys area, it probably makes more sense to go from the Buttermilks than from Aspendale. Yep. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a haul from Aspen. Yeah, um, and then uh, Greg, you got the question on Yosemite. Um, I mean, thoughts on Yosemite? It's one of my favorite places on Earth. Um, skiing <laughs> back there, <laughs> uh, you know, if you want to get into like Tuolumne High Country, uh, yeah, someone commented that Tiger Pass is the challenge, and so a lot of a lot of times people do like a a bike bike ride bike ski mission uh where they're starting to plow tioga pass in the spring and you can they'll open it to bikes but not to cars and that's a great way to get access back there before a lot of people um and yeah another little known secret which um you know maybe i shouldn't say here at all but 
uh, if you're into huts and you you want to go hang out in the backcountry, there is a small 10 person hut in Tuolumne that's operated in the winter on a first come first serve basis by the park service. And um, yeah, you can you can ski in and basically stay in Tuolumne Meadows and ski all around there. And it's a it's pretty fun. It's pretty rad. It's a, a cool and different kind of experience and worth going and checking out. Uh, Andy, I saw the comment for a base camp zone. Um, I, I think for me, uh, the Rock Creek drainage is a really one spot that I would recommend because there's great little camp spots and then you have access to a ton of terrain back there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Nate, you got a little base camp zone you would do? Yeah, that's a good spot. I mean, I, I think it really depends on kind of what you're looking for in terms of terrain. Um, you know, in terms of intermediate terrain, um, base camp zones, actually the Tioga Pass area is a pretty cool spot. Um, there's a lot of, you can go camp up, there used to be a little resort that they operated in the winter that you could go stay at, but that doesn't operate in the winter anymore, but it's in a great location and you can walk up the road, bike up the road, skin up the road, put a camp up there. And there's a lot of good sort of mini golf um, up and on the Eastern side of Tioga Pass. And then you can ski down in there. Um, yeah, I think that uh, Rock Creek's great. McGee Creek, the upper basin in McGee Creek has, has some really cool stuff. And, um, you know, I think some of my favorite spots are, are a little bit deeper, um, you know, kind of in the, the Bishop and other areas like that. Um, but certainly no shortage of basins that look a lot like this. This is up in the upper part of Condit Creek that you're looking into, actually. I mentioned it earlier, too, but uh... Um, Hidden Valley on the under the west face of Mount Shasta is a great spot for a base camp. Um, you know, depending on how you time it, you can have uh, running water in the form of a stream there. So you don't have to melt water. You can set up a base camp uh, kind of on the north side of Castleball Ridge as it drops down. There's all these like, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 foot um, kind of steep shots off of that, which are fun. Or you can hike uh, Shastina and ski like the third third highest peak in the Cascades, or you can summit uh, Mount Shasta and ski the West Face. So that's a cool base camp area also. Yeah. So yeah, come corn ski in the, in the spring and uh, you can ski in a baseball cap and shorts if you really wanted to. Um, I've gotten a bad sunburn doing that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, next photo, Ben, is, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a whole world of adventure out there. This is out of the Bridgeport area. Um, just lots of really cool couars and, you know, neat technical skiing as well as, you know, all the stuff we've kind of talked about up till now. Um, but, you know, honestly, um, the thing that makes the Eastern Sierra so unique and iconic is, uh, images like this last one. Um, this is uh, uh, next next photo, Ben. Um, this is uh, skiing Mount Williamson, Giant Steps. It's uh, Cody Townsend actually dropping into the Giant Steps as part of the 50 project this last year. And, you know, that's the Owens Valley down there in the distance. That's uh, LA Aqueduct and where all the water for Southern California comes from. And, uh, you know, you can ski 8,000 plus feet from the summit of 14,000 foot peaks all the way down to the valley floor. And if there's a lot of snow, you could even ski more than that. Um, and just a really iconic landscape to be in, incredible rock, uh, neat trees, just beautiful, beautiful zones and super, super special terrain to go kind of check out and, and be a part of and, and experience. And again, just high adventure and, and endless opportunities for adventure. So, um, yeah, that kind of brings us to the end and, you know, certainly hopefully the beginning for you all, um, you know, not to promote or, you know, sort of self-aggrandize at all, but the third edition of Backcountry Skiing, California's Eastern Sierra came out a couple years ago, uh, covers Bridgeport to Lone Pine and um, a lot of the stuff we talked about tonight and certainly a lot more is in that book as well as um, some other uh, descents and 50 classic ski descents of North America. Um, super fun, cool book to, to pick up and has become the, the backbone of a couple folks that are working to ski all of those descents right now. 
um, and you know a lot of other great titles from Wolverine as well. And if print isn't really your thing, um, my my book, the content in my book, at least in some of the other uh, titles in Colorado and and the Tetons are on a platform called Rack Up in digital form, and uh, you can you can download that and check it out. And if you like it, you can kind of pay for some of the content and and pick it up as well. So, All right, Nate, I got I to gotta pump you up here. Everyone in the comments is saying the Eastern Sierra guidebook is one of the best guidebooks out there. Oh, and, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I would agree. You know, it's kind of funny, like when you get in that east, east side mindset, at least for me, you know, it's usually paired with sleeping at hot springs and, you know, it's riding all day after your face has been buried in the book for a night, you know, studying these topos, you go ski all day you come back to the hot spring and you're studying these topos and the maps more and just like getting yourself fired up. So um, the books have definitely stoked a lot of fire in my own backcountry career. Um, and it sounds like for a lot of these people too. So that's cool. Awesome. Thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. You know, when Dan and I set out to write the book in 2006, um, our goal was really to, to do just that. I mean, we wanted it to be a coffee table book, not really something you had in your backpack. Um, so yeah, it's been fun. And, you know, every year we try to add or every edition, I guess we try to add to it and refresh photos and keep the, keep the stoke. There's certainly no shortage of things to do. And, um, you know, I think in the spirit of these series as well, there's plenty of opportunity to get out there and explore and, and find stuff and get away from people in Eastern Sierra. Got a suggestion to make uh, map sheets out of your guidebook so you could overlay them on. Yeah, on you know, we talked there. about it. We've got, we got a couple things in the in the works that I won't um, give too much away on tonight. But actually, if you're looking for something like Gaia or Caltopo, I would check out Rackup because that's basically the same thing. Um, just actually a little more uh, functional in a way because a lot of the content comes comes with it. So cool. And then uh, I saw a question earlier about uh, ski crampons in the spring, um, and they are extremely helpful, if not mandatory, sometimes for spring skiing in the Eastern Sierra. Um, yeah, I would say beyond that, honestly, um, uh, one of the first lessons that I learned skiing in the in the Sierra and the Eastern Sierra specifically is, if you're going to ski anything that you're going to have to boot pack, you should have crampons in your backpack. The snowpack here is such that it could be it could be a foot and a half of pal, and you're punching through down to boiler plate, and Delicious. it might be stable, but you want spikes on your feet. You don't always need an ice axe, but you should have spiky things on your feet. Yeah. Yep. And uh, just to uh, touch on Stephen's uh, suggestion about Gaia and Cal Topo, Rackup does now have slope shading and they also have GPS tracking. Um, so it, it, now all of those uh, programs do have very, very similar features. So it's pretty cool. Cool. Well, cool, you guys, thanks again for being here. Um, we do still have a few more minutes. So if you guys let us know um, questions that you guys have, I mean, you've got two outstanding resources hanging out right here. So if you do have any more questions, let us know. Um, we really do thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll give it a few more minutes here and let you guys chime in with any more questions. And otherwise, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see you on the skin track here shortly. So thanks again for tuning in everybody. So uh, I'll just tell a story in the meantime, while people are, while we're fielding some questions here of uh, some Shasta events that I've seen while I was up there. Um, actually, if I back up a little bit, Shasta is the reason why I wanted to start guiding. I went up there and uh, in the winter, with, with I hired a guide before I was a guide. Uh, we had this freak storm come in. There were 90 mile an hour winds. We ended up rescuing these two dudes who were hy hypothermic and we bailed. We got back to our tents and our tents had blown away. And all I could think of was like, holy shit, I love this. <laughs> and so that really stoked the fire for me that first trip on Shasta. So um, Shasta just holds a special place for me. And then I've seen people in a samurai outfit with a samurai sword charging up Avalanche Gulch before trying to find the portals to link up with the Lumerians up there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, crazy. 
Yeah, I see this question from Andrew uh, about trends on the snowpack beside, you know, um, it's a good question. You know, the Southern Sierra, generally speaking, doesn't see as much snow as the kind of Northern part. So the, you know, Bishop to Lone Pine zone um, tends to be a little more fickle than the Mammoth to Bridgeport zone. Incidentally, Mammoth is um, Mammoth Mountain. You know, consistently gets some of the most snow in the West because it's the lowest point on the Sierra Crest for about 50 miles in either direction, and the San Joaquin drainage um, basically is a huge fetch from the Pacific Ocean, and all the storm track comes off the Pacific right up the San Joaquin and just pummels Mammoth, and so that spills out a little bit. You know, 30 miles north, 30 miles south. Um, but as you get away from that, it kind of, it can taper a little bit. And in years like this, uh, La Nina's flow, um, you know, the jet tends to be a little bit further north. And that's why, you know, the Sierra as a whole doesn't favor as, as well. But Jackson and uh, interior BC and the Northwest gets hammered pretty hard. And in years like this, we may not see any snow in the Southern Sierra. But in a more uh, kind of El Nino flow where the jet's a little further south, um, you know, you might get pummeled in the Sierra and this, the Southern Sierra might have a ton of snow. You good on that question, Nate? Yep. Um, Andrew, I see your question here. Can we elaborate on avalanche prep for Lassen without a forecast? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I'll preface this with saying, if you're going somewhere without a forecast, you should either be very confident with your ability to forecast yourself or build in big margins to your tour plan and or both um, <clears throat> and be able to understand the snowpack and what you should be looking for to to understand instabilities now with that said a lot of times in california we're blessed with a deep snowpack so we really only see storm slab, wind slab um, after a storm cycle. Not the case this year. We see uh, persistent slab problems because of the high pressure that we have and low snowpack. Um, and I actually saw a thing from Lassen National Park last week where they had a big, I think it was a natural persistent slab that, that released up there. Um, so to prep, to go up there, if I were to do it, I would, uh, you know, I'm always following the weather uh, throughout the season. And I'll just look at uh, maybe the forecast for Lassen and see what the, if they're supposed to get any new snow, if they have any snow, I think the visitor center has good resources. Um, and then basically if I'm unsure or going during a storm, just make my trip plan to stay on low angle terrain um, the whole time while I'm there. And then, I mean, typically that's what my, winter seasons look like is skiing low angle terrain for most of the winter and then springtime rolls around and I start getting into steeper terrain after that snow gets older. So that was kind of a really roundabout answer for not having a forecast, but um, hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, a um, couple other questions I see here. A uh, question from Logan about the 108. Yeah, 108 into Sonora Pass. Um, it's actually, if you got a snowmobile, it's a great place to go play around in in the in the winter time there's a um, Bridgeport winter recreation area up there it's a snowmobile snowmobile zone um, there is forecasting up there and there's a lot of great kind of mini golf up um, that's all sled access and then when they plow that road come skiing opener at the end of April um, there's a ton of stuff that's all roadside and, and super super fun and, and worth checking out um, and so yeah the closures for roads I see from Mark uh, from Mike um, you know, basically, um, the practice on the east side, for the most part, is with a few exceptions that roads aren't gated, they just let the snow fall on them and naturally close. So, um, you know, once we start getting really good snowfall in kind of December, typically, or January, stuff will shut down and you end up having to park. And uh, the, the guidebook kind of calls out traditional winter parking areas that where the roads are generally accessible to or plowed to, and then spring parking areas where stuff is plowed and open to. Um, and then this last one I, I see uh, with ESAC. Yeah, thanks for the question. And 
Man, we're doing great. Uh, you know, we took a big, big step up this year. Um, and I am blown away at how supportive the community has been. We had a $105,000 um, fundraising goal. Um, and we have a $50,000 grant coming from the California State Parks OHV Green Stricker Fund. Um, nice. And we've raised $81,000 um, in direct contributions from the community uh, outside of that. So our biggest fundraising um, success of, of ever has happened this year. And, you know, we're over our fundraising um, goals and budget already. And, you know, I think we're doing as much as we can to bring uh, programming back to the community with that besides just avalanche forecasting. And so super appreciative of the question and all the support. Nice, Nate. Uh, Ethan, I see your question here about, uh, you know, skiing in the time of COVID. Um, yeah, you know, it's been really interesting coming into the uh, pandemic from a avalanche risk management background and seeing all these parallels to um, avalanche decision-making and COVID and how people behave. Um, so I will say, you know, listen to what's recommended for the local areas. If there's like, uh, I know in Truckee, short-term rentals, I think are, are um, not booking right now. They might've changed that since we changed tiers, but you know, really those rules are in place for a reason. And I know it's like, we want to go ski, but at the base of it, it's like, that's what we should be doing. But I understand that's also not the reality. Um, so, you know, if you do decide to travel, um, I would say best practices is, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands a lot. Um, and then also for me, it's like beacon shovel probe. And now this season it's face mask, hand sanitizer when I go into the backcountry, right? Because you never know, um, when you might have to assist with a rescue or run into somebody who's been hurt or, you know, someone just got lost or whatever it might be. And you were expecting to be outside all day and now you're in, in this potential exposure. So, you know, just kind of um, <clears throat> priming yourself for that potential uh, interaction with folks you weren't anticipating interacting with, I think is important. And, uh, you know, keep it safe. Hopefully we'll be through this soon. Yeah. Um, Ethan's got another question for general forecasts. Uh, anything on top of Noah? Yeah. <laughs> Ethan, um, I'm not sure if you're in the Tahoe area, but uh, open snow is a great like forecast discussion that really goes into depth on their daily snows. Um, so I read that a lot, especially when it's not snowing for hoping that it will snow. Um, <clears throat> and then there's another cool website called Tropical Tidbits, which is more of a graphical uh, <clears throat> satellite imagery that you can see in different regions all over the world actually, um, based on different forecast models. I'll type it in here, um, but that's pretty cool. But generally I do uh, NOAA, open snow. I look at my forecast center and then CalTOPO has a layer where you can look at snow tell sites, snow telemetry, and uh, they'll be all over your area. You might even not know about them, uh, but some of them will give you you know, temperature and wind speed. And some of them will give you more information like snow depth, uh, new snow, all sorts of stuff. So um, I'll look at the, I'll look at the snow tell sites if we have kind of an inconsistent storm and I'm trying to find where it snowed the most because I'll go on the snow tell sites and kind of dig into some information there. Yeah, one or two other things um, that I'd add to that, or I guess three other things. One is that, uh, you know, the Eastern Sierra really south of Bridgeport is in between the radar view from both the, the Reno uh, National Weather Service office and the Hartford National Weather Service office. So we're in this little black hole and there's such strong orographic effects around here that it's really hard for them to forecast. And Mammoth is such a snow magnet that it just becomes an interesting, interesting place. And so NOAA, is I would say, you know, at best 75% accurate on the regular for this area. And it's no, no harshing on those forecasters. They're, they're good friends and, and folks of uh, the community. But um, in addition to what Will mentioned on the ESAC site, we have a weather tab and we custom built an app a couple of years ago that grabs all of those 
same kind of Snowtel and local MET sites. And you can kind of filter by um, different parameters, like you wanted to see snowfall or SWE or wind, and you can kind of see information at those zones um, that those sites are in. Um, there's some good information in Yosemite. Um, and then another really good uh, thing on top of Tropical Tidbits is windy.ty or windyty.com, um, which kind of does similar types of things and can be a really good forecast tool for some of these little areas. Yeah, great. Um, got a question here on dogs coming on tours. Um, my personal opinion, uh, I would say it doesn't reflect everybody's opinion in the industry. And I'm sure everyone probably has their own opinion, but uh, for me, it's like, all right, are you bringing your dog on the tour? And is that dog getting a beacon on their collar, right? And if the dog does have a beacon and there's an avalanche, are you gonna find that dog before you find me? And that's something that's not cool with me uh, going out with partners because I would rather be saved first than save your dog. And there's real, I don't know if there's a way to tell, but you know, that's something to consider. Um, also I know dogs get injured, um, on the edges of, of skis a bit, cause they'll kind of chase you in your feet and they can get cut up pretty bad. Um, but again, like I have a bunch of friends who bring dogs on tours and it's usually all good. Um, and it's usually in mellow terrain. So yeah. I think it definitely depends on the terrain and your goals for the day. You know, if I'm going out to ride a big pillow line, I'm, I'm not bringing dogs, <laughs> you know, yeah. but if I'm growing, going out to take my dog, then, then, you know, it's great. So I think it's, it's definitely personal preference. And as long as you're respectful to everyone around you, one note is that, you know, if you're in a wilderness area, uh, you know, dogs might be required to be on leash, which, you know, it, it's, you want to follow those local, local rules for sure. Uh, depending on the terrain you're riding in so yeah um that kind of brings up a good point that i love to talk to all my kind of intro newish people about um getting into the backcountry is that backcountry riding and skiing is all about terrain management and understanding how you move through the terrain and how that terrain can affect you and so you know we're talking about this dog question and the first thing that, that we're, we think about is, all right, well, what kind of terrain are we bringing it in? And you could backcountry ski your whole life and never ski in, in or under avalanche terrain and you'll never be in an avalanche and you'll have a great time and you, know, you make hippie turns for the rest of your life. And that's totally cool. And some people are on that, on that train and that's a great place to bring a dog. You know, um, Now, if you're trying to go ride the Signar Kular, probably not the dog trip, you know, but um, terrain is super important and building your knowledge of slope angle and how it affects you at a point in time is uh, one of the best skills you can cultivate in your career. I'm still doing it. Never ending, never yeah. ending. I think- Trying uh, to achieve Jedi status, you know? Yeah, well, and Jeremy Jones has the classic line of avalanche, school and avalanche education is one that you never actually graduate from. Yes, very true. Um, got another question here on uh, effective, effectiveness of airbags in the Sierra. How about for those who are new to backcountry riding mainly low angle terrain? Um, so avalanche airbags are effective at keeping your body on the surface of a slide. That's just what they're made to do. Um, now, if you're avalanched in terrain that gets uh, siphoned through trees or rocks, the avalanche won't help you very much avoid striking or getting a traumatic injury. Um, so for me, like I ride with an airbag almost all the time and it's just an extra margin of safety, but I'm always looking at the terrain of like, is this terrain capable of producing an avalanche? What would happen if it does? And what are the consequences if I'm caught in that avalanche? And so um, rarely are my decisions buffered by an airbag on my backpack. Um, they're always made beforehand. And the airbag is there just like my beacon is there just in case. Yep. Yeah. 
I own okay. three and I've never used one. <laughs> I try to, I try to make good decisions, right? Yeah. And I, I, I would reiterate exactly what Will just said, you know, and I, I teach a lot of backcountry 101 education and I get that question all the time. Like, do I need an airbag? And I often say like, it's a great tool, but it should never dictate your line choice, you know? And there's, there's a whole gauntlet of education and gear and skill building and time in the back country. And just like Will said, you can, you can stay far away from avalanche terrain. So it's the airbag kind of becomes a useful tool a little further down in education and skill set. Usually I, I, like I say, I have them, I, I bring them for certain kinds of terrain. Um, I ride with one on a snowmobile quite a bit just because I'm so much heavier um, and I have a better chance, of, but it, it's really terrain choice, snowpack, you know, good decision making are, are all way above, you know, what I ride if I have an airbag. They're fun. <laughs> they're, they're fun to blow up on your friends too. <laughs> yeah, Ben, that brings up a good point too. Um, kind of the second piece of that question Lee had was how about for those who are new to backcountry riding, mainly low angle terrain? And Lee, I would say, uh, you know, the cost of an airbag anywhere from, I don't know, 500 to a thousand dollars. Right. And what about getting three of your friends who are thinking about buying an airbag and all of you pulling your money and hiring a guide for three days for a weekend to help tune you up and tune up your knowledge on uh, terrain management and your understanding of moving through avalanche terrain. Sometimes that might be better money spent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Totally, totally cannot underscore it enough. I mean, we spend thousands of dollars on equipment attached to us and almost never spend money on education. And it's a shame. It's a really, it's an investment. It's an investment that should be made regularly and uh, it can't underscore it enough. Um, two other things kind of related to that. I see the question about probe length. Um, you know, I carry a 320 um, here just because it's, we get a lot of snow and it's, you know, you get a small slide, it ends up with a lot of debris. Um, it's still not long enough. You know, we've had a couple fatalities on the east side that people were buried 10 plus feet deep. So, um, you know, hopefully you never have to use it. And radios, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, you know, increasingly it's, it's been a new tool in my bag and I don't carry it every day, but every day I don't carry it. I wish I had it. Um, and so I'm generally starting to carry it, um, more and more, almost, almost every single day. The communication piece is super, super important, you know, and when shit goes wrong, you know, knowing what's happening is really valuable and a radio is a good way to get it. Absolutely. I, I even, you know, consider it my fourth piece of Abbey gear, you know, beacon shovel probe radio. You know, I want to be communicating. And just like Nate said, when I don't bring one, I'm annoyed and my friends are annoyed with me because <laughs> Ben, like, are you dropping? Like, what are you doing up there? You know, like you, you need that communication. <laughs> um, and it just, it will, it will help you so much in the back country. I run all BCA radios um, from the, for the reason that that's what most people have. Um, I've used a lot of other radios. I've actually been able to perform rescues um, because I could hear someone on my BCA radio. And I, when I turned on my other radio, I could not hear this person, you know, that was stuck in a tree well that wasn't even in my party, um, but I could hear them on a BCA. And since then, it's kind of what I've used. Um, rugged radios are pretty cool. And then, you know, we also, I have some people that use ham radios. Um, but I think for, for most people, a BCA, you know, link is, is a great radio for sure. But do your own research. See what your buddies have. If you've got five buddies with a certain kind of radio, probably get that radio too. If you ever want to be uh, convinced about the importance of radios, there's a great podcast called uh, Slide, the Avalanche podcast um, with, uh, oh, you guys know who Doug it is? Krause. Doug Krause. Yeah. And uh, he harps. His whole thing is communication in a team. And uh, it's, it's like predicated on how are you gonna communicate at a distance if you don't have a radio? So he's like, yeah, it's essential. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome guys. I think, you know, we're, we're here at our one and a half hours. I think we're gonna, we're gonna leave it there. And, and thanks so much for being here guys. Will, Nate, you guys have been absolutely amazing. Um, let the, the, the people know how to get a hold of you guys, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, how they can support you and, and your different communities and, 
Um, again, thanks so much for being here, guys. We really do appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having us. It's great, great to be here, and uh, hopefully, see some of you out there on the skin track. Absolutely. Yeah, I saw a question earlier. Everyone wants to hire me. Best way is reach out on Instagram. Mountains are going. I must go, and uh, we can go from there. Cool. Yeah, you can right. Track me down on Instagram as well. N8. Greenberg. Killer. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Ben, for Thanks, sending everybody. all that. Um, this will be posted next week on our Facebook page, on our website. Uh, definitely, you know, if you're interested in some other zones, next week's webinar is Go Explore Northeast Touring Zones. We've got another discussion discussion with a great author, David Goodman. We've got panelists from the Catamount Trail Association, Granite Backcountry Alliance, Outdoor Gear Exchange. And if you didn't know, there is great backcountry skiing in the Northeast. They just keep it a secret. Um, so it's, we're, we're blowing up their scene next week. So tune in for that one as well. Um, if you want to support your, your crew here at Weston, check out some of our new soft goods. We've got new touring hats that just dropped. We've got killer apparel from uh, local artists. Uh, we really appreciate you guys supporting our dream uh, of, you know, living a life in the backcountry. So we really couldn't do it without you guys. Um, so yeah, thanks again for tuning in. Um, we, we will see you on the skin track and tune in next week and every week for the Slay at Home series. You.